Blender 5.0 just dropped and I'm here to tell you all about the new, the same but different, and the broke. Whether you've been blending since version 2.7 or just starting today, Blender 5.0 will have some game-changing new features for you, so let's get into it. First up, ACES Color is finally here. ACES 1.3 and 2.0 have been implemented directly into Blender as an alternative to AGX and Filmic. This allows you to easily work with the ACES pipelines in both standard and HDR versions and follow the common ACES workflow that is used in the CG and VFX industry. With the release of 4.5, Blender's compositor got some much needed love, and 5.0 continues that journey, with changes like an updated split node that supports rotation, compositing node trees are now a data block, making them reusable across blend files, alpha over nodes now support disjoint and conjoint over operations, all transformation nodes now have an extension node option, the glare node now has a sunbeams mode, which is similar to the old sunbeams node, but much easier to use and get high quality results with out of the box. A new compositor sequence strip modifier was added, allowing for scene-dependent and custom compositing per strip. Several new built-in compositing assets were added, including things like chromatic aberration, film grain and sensor noise, vignette, and sepia to name just a few. And another huge one, the lens distortion note now no longer messes up your transparency but maintains it. Glare has been improved for more stable results with smaller highlights, and the fog low is now more realistic. Blender is still going really hard on their nodes approach, and so Geometry Nodes got some good love once more. There's now new bundle nodes, allowing you to combine, join, and separate a host of values with a single node link. For the programs out there, this is what you'd call structs. Closures have been introduced through the new closure zone and evaluate closure nodes. These allow you to inject additional nodes to evaluate into a node group. It's quite hard to understand if you're not well versed in geometry nodes, but it's super powerful. So I recommend checking out Blender's full blog post on closures to learn more and, you know, check out some tutorials once they appear in the near future. A ton of new volume nodes have been added to process volume grids directly. Again, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with this, but covering all of them would require a video of itself. And someone like, for example, Arendelle is much, much more capable of making that. But I'd like to highlight the effect grid node, at least, that moves a fox value along a velocity field, allowing you to make something very cool like this, for example. Everyone's favorite node, the viewer node, now supports non-geometry data. It also takes in a dynamic number of inputs now and is also able to show a single value directly. A new UV tangent node has been added to give access to tangent vectors, for which I'm 100% not smart enough to use, but you know, node wizards, go ham. And finally, a bunch more small tweaks, improvements, and optimizations have been made. Now, just like geometry nodes, shader nodes now support closures, bundles, and repeat zones as well, allowing you node wizards to blow my mind some more. The Nishita Sky Texture now has multiple scattering, allowing for a much more realistic sky texture. There's a really cool new radial tiling node, allowing easy creation of the coolest MoGraph patterns. I'm looking at you, Ducky. Voronoi nodes are now faster to use, but as a result, have a different pattern that is being generated. And finally, a very silly function, namely the enable use nodes that you've probably heard a million times in tutorials, has been auto-enabled and removed for materials and worlds. There's also six new super useful modifiers built in geometry nodes on the back end to improve modeling workflows and speed up tedious repetitive tasks that were done manually before. These are the array modifier that behaves similar to the old version but now supports easy distribution along a curve, gizmos, and randomization. The old array is still available but will disappear in future versions. Scatter on surface, which is the big brother of the old particle system scattering. It instances objects on any surface using features like density, amount, attribute, control and image texture control. Instance on elements creates instances on points, edge faces or face corners. Randomized instances adds additional randomization to instances created by other modifiers. Curve to tube turns any curve into, well, a tube, <laughs> but it includes amazing new features like finally being able to do round caps and built-in UV mapping to apply your materials correctly. And number six, geometry input can be used at the top of a modifier stack to copy the final geometry of another object. Further in modeling, we also got a quick lattice deform selected operator, which you can access through your shift A add menu. Merge by distance behavior has been improved and UV's got some love with better sync selection, a new pack to custom region option for pack islands, an arrange and align selected UV islands operator and a move selected UVs on axis operator. Now for animation, a new geometry attribute constraint has been added that directly samples vector quaternion or four x four matrix attributes from geometry and applies these to an object 
objects or bones transforms. Bones have two new options in the custom shape section, effect gizmo and use as pivot. Shape keys now support copy to selected, which means that all drag for editing all selected also works now. Talking about shape keys, the shape key list now supports multi-selection and drag and drop functions. And there's a new make basis operator that makes the active shape key the new basis key, effectively applying it to your mesh. Copy global transform is no longer an add-on, but simply integrated into Blender. And last, a new jump by time delta operator has been added for jumping forwards or backwards in time by a user specified frame or second amount. You can now mark scenes as assets, allowing you to quickly drag in scenes from your asset library, which then become the active scene. Blender's free asset bundle has also been updated with a new realistic skeleton contribution made by the community. On a technical note, data blocks can now have names up to 255 bytes, coming from 63 bytes, and the .blend file format has been changed to support larger buffers, which is needed to store meshes with, for example, a few hundred million verts. I have no idea who does that, but... I guess there's people out there. And if you're one of them, you'll be running out of storage space often. To fix my own storage issues, I've been looking to get a network attached storage device for a while. So when Ugreen reached out to partner up on their new NOS, the DH2300, it was an absolute no brainer. The DH2300 offers large and flexible storage up to 60 terabytes, which to put that in perspective is about 20 million branded frames or 60,000 installations of Blender 5.0. It works with a wide range of drives, has internationally recognized data security certifications, two-factor authentication, easy access with paired devices through NFC, streams your media up to 4K HDR, has smart photo organization to keep all your photos organized, and is built for your home and office with whisper quiet operation. But more importantly, it's ultra fast. So when you're working directly from the NAS, you'll never notice a thing. And if all of that isn't enough, there's a big brother, the DH4300 Plus, which is literally bigger, better, and faster. The Ugreen DH2300 is currently available on Amazon and the Ugreen web store. And if you're quick, until December 1st for Black Friday, you can enjoy their biggest discount of 20% off. So do yourself a favor and check it out now through the links in the description. Cycles, my love, just got unbiased sampling for volumes, allowing for less noisy volume renders. Although not in all cases, most scenarios should see a major improvement in volume clarity. The old biased version is still available though, if the new algorithm that it uses runs slower for you. And it can be found in render volume biased. Subsurface scattering now uses multiple bounces, reducing darkening artifacts. The principled BSDF and metallic BSDF now support physically based iridescence effects caused by thin film. We've just got confirmation that adaptive subdivision is finally no longer an experimental feature. It's now available on the subdiff modifier by default and comes with a new adaptive subdivision object space option. Furthermore, optics denoising quality has been improved. A new render time pass which visualizes time spent to render each pixel is now available and tiling is now on by default and can only be disabled by increasing the tile size. As for the other side, EV, few layer overrides are now available in EV, meaning that you can finally do those clay renders in Blender's ultra fast render engine. Curves have been rewritten to better support all new curve object types and features and take the geometry closer to Cycle's 3D curves. This also comes with a new cylinder option for thicker curves without the flat ribbon appearance. EV material compilation is now up to four times faster. And Madcap's got a rework to include a layer for specular light, enhancing shading quality and readability in the viewport. Grease Pencil got a new pen tool that behaves like the legacy curves object. There's also now motion blur that can be enabled in the render settings under Grease Pencil with an optional quality steps slider. And the final major change, similar to other line tools in programs like Illustrator, corners can now have one of three types in Grease Pencil, round, sharp, and flat. As for physics, a small change to point caches has been implemented, which should make them both smaller and faster. Also, smoke and fire vorticity no longer varies with time scale and time step, which was an older bug in Blender. Now, here's an important sidetrack, because with every update, we don't just get new features, we also get new problems. So here's a few of the most notable changes that you might need to pay attention to. Support for Intel Max has been removed. Support for pre-version 2.5 animation data has been dropped, which I 
don't think many people will have an issue with. And the big one, minimum GPU requirements have been increased to NVIDIA GeForce 900 series or higher, AMD 4th Gen and up, and Intel Kaby Lake architecture or newer. It is notable here that older GPUs might still work according to the Blender Foundation, but Blender will not provide support if they don't. Minor pipeline changes have been implemented, mainly relating to importing and exporting OBJ, FBX, USD, Alembic, GLTF, and Collada files to further improve cross-platform usage. If you make add-ons or other integrations for Blender, as usual, most of it will no longer work with this new update. So make sure to check out all the breaking changes to Blender's Python API online for a full list of changes. Sculpting has got some much needed improvements like a customizable curve to change tablet pen pressure behavior, mode specific brush settings, so no more overlap between texture painting and sculpting, for example, and at least two times more compressed undo data for deformations, making undo memory usage significantly smaller, resulting in you being able to erase more of your mistakes. Blender's video sequencer has gotten a big update, making using it for your edits more viable than ever, and I recommend checking the full feature release on their website. And second to last, if you're a VR Blender user, there's a few quality of life improvements. A new vignette effect was added to the screen when moving. More discrete camera movement is now possible with the thumbsticks. New VR navigation options have been added in the preferences with easy access through the VR end session. And of course, finally, hundreds of small changes have been made to Blender's user interface. Most notably, the ability to search existing collections when moving an object to a collection, larger font previews when selecting fonts, a more legible animation playhead, and custom theme generation has become significantly easier for if you really want to share your interesting taste in UI. And if you're a big Node user, there's also much to rejoice about too, like the ability to join group inputs, double-clicking empty space will now take you out of your group nodes, a new rectangular look for collapsed nodes, Shift S to replace a node has been found again after being lost since version 4.0, easy to access toolbar functions for cutting, muting, and rerouting nodes has been added, and finally, the ability to search for strings, data blocks, and group inputs in the node search operator is now possible too. There's tons more changes to the UI and interface though, so make sure to check out the full release notes for that. Overall, Blender 5.0 gives us many improvements and changes as it's the next huge step in Blender's journey. And so if you enjoy Blender, please consider donating to support development and I'll see you in the next one.